So step number one is develop policy standards and controls. A simple control might be something like if we want to bring new type of data into our uh, analytics and operational environment, we need legal approval. The GDPR is very specific uh, sections and articles around getting approval. Now you might set up a workflow in Colibra to operationalize approval of that workflow and also create an audit trail and a history. Step number two is creating a data taxonomy. Clearly, you cannot do data governance over anything unless you figure out what that data is. So clearly, a, a potential taxonomy might be customer data, employee data, prospect data. Those could be your level one communities in Colibra. A level two community under customer could be customer identity, customer contacts, and customer preferences. And under your level two communities, you might have a level three community, for example, under customer contacts, you might have customer mailing address, customer email address, customer billing address, et cetera. Step number three is to confirm your data owners. So as we discuss, there's a 16 step, very rigorous process to support GDPR, as well as these other data sovereignty laws. There's a lot of work to be done, which is why you need to identify these data owners. These data owners are typically business data owners, though you also might have technical data owners and legal data owners. These data owners are gonna be participants in Colibra workflows that would operationalize data governance. The next step is to identify critical data elements and critical data sets. So taking the earlier example, if we think about customer preferences as being an important level two or level three category, do not email, do not phone, do not call, those could be examples of critical data elements in Colibra that have to be operationalized. Now, the interesting part with these data sovereignty laws is the following situation. In the US, as you probably know for the most part, if you send an email as part of an email marketing campaign, you have to go through what is called an opt out. So unless a recipient opts out, you can send them an email in most cases. In the European Union with GDPR and in Canada with CASO, the anti-spamming legislation, it's actually opt in. So unless a re recipient actually physically opts in, you cannot send them an email. So what you could consider is a, an operational risk control framework which says anytime we want to send an email marketing campaign in Canada and in the European Union, we have to make sure we adhere to an opt-in. So the same set of controls that you put in place for GDPR could also apply to Canada CASO and those could be operationalized in Colibra. Step number five is establish data collection standards. So the GDPR as well as a lot of the other data sovereignty laws really deal with what is called informed consent and lawful use. So once again, you could use Colibra workflows to operationalize these data collection standards. So if you're bringing in new data into your uh, environment, you need to make sure there's a workflow with sign off from the business as well as legal and the privacy professionals. Acceptable use standards. Once the data is in your environment, are you allowed to use the data for a particular purpose? And are there reasons why you can't use it? So once again, we get into this whole concept of uh, informed consent as well as secondary use. So you cannot get uh, a customer's consent to use the data for one purpose and then repurpose for something else. That's probably not allowed based on GDPR as well as some of the other data sovereignty legislation. So once again, any of those approvals could be documented in Colibra. Another very important part of the GDPR, as well as some of these other data sovereignty laws, is really establishing data masking standards. So the GDPR is very particular, which is if you're able to demonstrate that you can anonymize your data, you really don't need to worry about the GDPR. But the devil is in the details. So for example, if uh, the HR department is working with the data science team, and the data science team says, give me a list of all your uh, employees along with your compensation. Oh, by the way, feel free to mask the first name and last name. Great, you may think now, is that subject to the GDPR? If I'm transferring compensation details from the European Union to the US, if I've hidden the first name and the last name, the answer is maybe, maybe not. Because what happens if you've got the compensation, but you can see that there's a director of HR, gender female, and she makes $200,000 a year. The universe of those uh, candidates is pretty low, so you can actually reverse engineer some of the identities. So as part of GDPR, as well as some of these other data sovereignty laws, 
it's important to have specific standards that have been certified by professionals to say that the data has been truly anonymized. In the HR example I gave you earlier, you might decide to hide titles, and you might also decide to potentially hide gender, but more importantly, you might have salary bands. You might have a salary band that says zero to $50,000, 50 to 100, and over $100,000. So as a way to reasonably anonymize the data. And those data masking standards can be documented within Colibra's. Colibra's operating model supports policies and standards. The next step is to conduct a data protection impact assessment. A sample data element might be race that might be needed potentially for anti-money laundering compliance. You might bring in a data set, which could be Facebook data or Instagram data. Or you might bring in a new application. You need to conduct a data protection impact assessment, which really consists of a detailed set of questions that you can send out to multiple respondents. And you can use the forms and workflows within Colibra to support compliance with these data protection impact assessments. Vendor risk assessments is also important. As part of the GDPR, if you're moving data to what is called a, you know, a processor, and that processor is sending data further downstream to a subprocessor, you need to conduct an impact assessment to make sure that the vendor is actually complying with the terms of the GDPR. So the next step is really improve data quality. That's a little narrow from the way we think of data quality in the broader data governance context. This is more around if a data subject approaches the company, the controller, and asks for their data to be cleansed, then you need to have the controls in place to actually cleanse that data. Step number 11 is probably the most intrusive part of this entire GDPR program insofar as it relates to data governance. Article 30 of the GDPR deals with maintaining a record of processing activities. What does that really mean? It's really metadata and data lineage on steroids. So in our experience, what you have to do is you have to maintain a list of all your applications, whether they're in production, non-production, disaster recovery, quality assurance, testing, dev, you need to identify what your critical data elements are and understand in the, in the context of GDPR, critical data elements are not just what we would call sensitive data. The GDPR takes a much more expansive definition of personal data to be really anything around a, a data subject, a customer or an employee. And then you've got to do a mapping to say for all my maybe 1,000 applications, here's which applications contain what sensitive data. And then you've got to be able to show lineage and that lineage is not just within the firewalls of the enterprise. It will certainly extend as you move data from the European Union outside the EU. More importantly, if you're sending data to a processor or a subprocessor, your data lineage needs to account for that. So Colibra has very robust traceability as well as data lineage across Colibra as well as Colibra Connect. And that really, I think, is foundational to support data lineage within the GDPR. Another critical aspect of uh, the GDPR is governing your analytical models. So not only are you governing what I would call the input variables, you're also covering the outputs of your risk models. So a good example might be you don't want to discriminate against employees based on certain attributes like national origin, sexual orientation, or gender. You clearly won't do that. But what happens if you're taking some of that employee data and you're trying to build a predictive model to say which employees are more likely to stay with the company longer to reduce churn rates. Makes total sense. Now what you've done is when you build a model, you find out that candidates who live closer to work are less likely to leave because their commute times are shorter. That makes great sense. What you've done is you've used zip code, right, or your postal code as an input variable. But what might, that might do is you might actually discriminate against minorities because you're using zip code as an input variable into your predictive models. So a best practice would be when you're actually building out these analytical models, the data scientists need to be sharing those models with the legal and privacy folks and getting sign off. And you could use Colibra workflows to be able to get sign off to make sure that you're not ending up with not just disparate treatment, but disparate impact in terms of how you're dealing with certain uh, individuals, whether they're customers or employees or prospects. Step number 13 is managing end user computing. So once again, this is around security and privacy of information. Not only are we protecting information that might exist within our structured data source, not only are we dealing with 
protecting information sitting in structured data sources. We're also dealing potentially with unstructured data that might be sitting in Ribbit files, SharePoint files, or potentially even in Microsoft Access databases or in uh, Excel files. So a best practice here is to maintain an inventory of these um, different repositories, whether it's Excel or SharePoint or Ribbit files or Access databases in Colibra. So at any point in time, we know where all the sensitive data might be sitting. It might not be exhaustive, and you might have to rely on an honor code for respondents within your organization to, to tell you where these end user computing applications are sitting, but it's better than not having an inventory at all. Step number 14 is governing the life cycle of information. Once again, this is much more narrow and much specialized. It deals with the concept of the right to be forgotten, which is if you've got data sitting within uh, one of your source systems and a data subject comes to you and says, I want you to delete all my data. Well, based on step number 11, you need to have proper data lineage and you need to have a proper inventory of your data to understand where the data is sitting. So you need to know where is the data pertaining to my data subject sitting before you can actually delete it. Step number 15 deals with data sharing agreements. So when you move data between jurisdictions, when you're moving data, for example, for the GDPR between the European Union, outside the European Union, maybe to the US, if you're dealing potentially with China, and you're dealing with data moving from China to the US for analytics, or Russia to the US, or Russia to the rest of Europe for analytics, you need to set up data sharing agreements to say, if we send you the data, here's how you need to comply with the data. Now, oftentimes you've got binding corporate rules, or you might have other contracts that enforce the adherence to these uh, regulations. But what you can do with Colibra is you can set up a semantic representation of a data sharing agreement and potentially point to these binding corporate rules or other agreements that really solidify regulatory compliance. And finally, you want to enforce compliance with controls. And once again, here you can set up these controls through workflows in Colibra. And the beauty is you could have one control, for example, a control around not sending an email as part of an email marketing campaign in Canada and in the European Union unless there is an opt-in. And these consistent uh, controls can be used to operationalize compliance with multiple data sovereignty laws in different jurisdictions. So once again, you know, just to step back, GDPR is just one data sovereignty uh, legislation. There's others like the Canada CASL, the Russian Federation, personal data localization law, the People's Republic of China cybersecurity law, and Colibra is a great tool to support data governance and enterprise data management, all the way from managing your policies, creating a taxonomy, managing your data owners and your roles, your critical data elements and your critical data sets, as well as implementing workflows and showing an audit trail to support adherence with the regulators. Thank you very much.